Hey, good morning, church. We're so happy you're here. Thanks for coming and joining us on this overcast but lovely day. At least the sun's not bearing down on us. Didi said, I wish it, I was wishing the sun on us, and though I don't wish that, at least it takes some of these sprinkles away. It's fun to see your faces out there today. We're thankful that you're here. If you're happy to be here, would you just give us a clap or something? Make some noise. You know how this goes. I'm going to ask you to participate, and then the rest is up to you. But I see you, and hopefully you see us too. This is from Romans 8, and it's the word of the Lord. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Are you ready for worship today? Hey, we're going to uh, allow you to sit or stand or whatever you want to do. This time is for you. And it's between you and the big man upstairs, but we're happy you're here. This is a new one called Rattle. Saturday was sad. Surely it will still. Since when has it possible? Ever something. Friday's disappointment. Sunday's empty too Since when has it possible To let us
All right. Are we back? Are we back, huh? We're going to take a, a, a few necessary breaks uh, in the midst of this because uh, outdoor instruments. have a, a, a little bit of a malfunction and that's okay how many of you uh, were participating in our online services over the last couple months good uh, I just want to take a second to uh, show some appreciation for those that made that happen uh, we've got a great uh, media team that's been working really hard to bring those things to life uh, we've had, you know, several members of uh, the worship team that have agreed to participate and stuff like that. While it's not uh, where we wanted to be, right? It's where we were, and uh, that's okay. Today is a special day because we get to be together, even though it's still a little bit different. It's something that uh, God is allowing us to do. God has uh, brought us to this moment and where we go from here is is up to us we still have the responsibility to be the church even though we're not inside even when we cut step off the property today still be in the church this is one you'll recognize I was big
search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty grace And treasures of faith Never enough And you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Oh, there's nothing better than you.
Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing last time Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you God, that is true. Whether when we sing those words, whether we truly believe it or not, God, we are, we are singing, we are speaking, and we are living that truth, God. Sometimes it takes us a little bit longer to realize it. Some days we don't quite feel it, but it doesn't change the fact that, God, there is nothing and no one like you. You take things that are absolutely dead and you make them come to life, God. You take things where perhaps it feels like there's no meaning at all and God, you uh, in, instill your truth and your love into those things and, and they become life, God. And they become life because of your presence. They become life because of who you are and because what you have accomplished with your broken creation, God. You take things that are broken and you make them new again. You take things that are, are barren and you make them able to produce again, God. See, there is no one or no thing that is too far from your love, God. That is so far away that you have just completely turned your back. God, there is no one that you can't reach, God. And God, yes, we celebrate today. We celebrate because because in many ways we're we're back together as a church but god we cannot just celebrate that god if that if that is the pinnacle of our celebration today god we have absolutely unequivocally and absolutely missed the whole point god so god if there is anyone in this place that is just satisfied because they're just here god i pray that you would speak to our spirit God, that you would show us that it's so much more than just us being on this property right now in this place together. Yes, yes, God, this is great. Yes, we're excited. Yes, we should be joyful. But God, we should be joyful because we are here to together celebrate the love and the potential that is found in you, God. The transformation that only you offer. Lord. So God, we are grateful. We're thankful that we have a place to gather. We're thankful that, that we are able to gather again. But God, let us not miss the fact that you are still the God, the author of creation, the author of transformation, Lord. So God, as we open up your word, as we seek your will, God, may our hearts be open to what you want us to hear, to experience, and to live this morning on this Sabbath day, on this beautiful Sunday. Thank you, God. We're grateful for you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, it's good to see you all. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everybody's like, I don't know what to do outside. I, it's just, we don't, we don't know what to do out here, right? It's good to see you all.
It really is. It's good to be together here. Um, I still really, it, man, there's just a, a complete lack of balance out here. Need some people over here. I know it's a long walk, but no, you don't, you don't really have to. You don't really have to move. I don't think any of you are going to do it anyway. But it is, uh, it is good to be here this morning. And, uh, you know, David mentioned it earlier. Let's see if I can do this without shaking the table too much. David, David mentioned it earlier, but um, man, there's, there's just a lot of people that, um, that, that we could recognize. Um, a lot of people that uh, uh, have made it possible uh, for us to, to uh, get to this point today and uh, that have carried us, helped carry us through uh, the last, I think I said it was, uh, it had been 15 Sundays uh, since we have been together uh, in this place. So it is really good, uh, really good to be back together. And we're grateful, uh, grateful for everyone who made those last 15 Sundays possible. Um, I know many of you who followed us, you, you saw people on screen, um, but I'll tell you what, the people on screen didn't do near as much work and didn't put near as much effort uh, into making that stuff happen as the people who were behind the cameras. And most of the time that was actually, um, uh, uh, Pastor Kyle was behind the camera and sometimes on the camera. Um, Kelly Day, uh, we had several people that uh, just, just helped help behind the scenes and we are so grateful for the talent, uh, but not just the talent. You know, a lot of people have talent that they don't use. A lot of people have talent that they don't invest. And uh, we're grateful for those who invested that talent. Our worship team uh, would gather at various times throughout the week and um, we'd kind of get together and, and try to be together, yet try to be careful and, and trying to organize uh, schedules and stuff. And, but just lots of people who invested in that, that we are just eternally, eternally grateful for. And I'm sure I left some people out, but, um, but uh, thank you for bearing with us as we, as we learned. And we're continuing to learn. Uh, you know, we, we still don't know exactly what things look like from this point forward. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna go with it. We're gonna, we're gonna seek his will and, and try to seek what's best and uh, continue from this point forward, doing the best with what we know. And, uh, I, I think everybody just kind of kind of feels that way um, in in all areas of life, but it's good it's good to be back. I want to talk a little bit about rhetoric, right? So we've heard this term rhetoric, okay? So rhetoric is something that we hear, especially as we especially as we start to approach an election year uh, like we have here, as we start to approach uh, November. Terms like rhetoric start to come about, and, and you and, and you hear people talk about this person's rhetoric and that person's rhetoric. And so rhetoric really is is a language. It's a language that's designed to have a persuasive effect on an audience. Now, some of you may have heard of things like rhetorical questions or rhetorical affirmations. And, and maybe some of you actually, uh, maybe some of you have been the recipient of some rhetorical questions. So a rhetorical question is a question that someone asks you, but they don't really want the answer. Right? So it's a, it's a question that's designed to make a point. Sometimes, like when I receive them, growing up and, and sometimes even in my household now, they're really meant to, to kind of like, like hit me right here and affect change. They're supposed to be persuasive. So sometimes the, the persuader is seeking to make a change in my life or in the recipient's life with a rhetorical question. So here's some rhetorical questions that, that I have heard either growing up or perhaps even yesterday. So a rhetorical question such as, who do you think you are? Right? They don't want an answer. They've determined who you are, and they're trying to help you understand that they know who you are, and they don't want an explanation. Who do you think you are? This is one I get a lot. What were you thinking? Like, 
What, what were you thinking there? Now I could go, well, I was, I was kind of thinking that, no, 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 I don't want to know what you were thinking. I want you to know that whatever you were thinking was not the right thing to think, right? Do you think these dishes are going to clean themselves? <laughs> Anyone heard that before? Nobody that asks that wants a yes or no answer. And the person who's asked that question doesn't really want to answer it. Because if you answer no, then you know you have to clean the dishes. If you answer yes, you know that you, you're acknowledging that you made a mistake. Do you think money grows on trees? Anybody heard that before? You think money grows on trees? Are you trying to air condition the outdoors? Anybody heard that recently? So there are questions that are designed to persuade the recipient, but the persuader doesn't really want an answer. And then there are these things called rhetorical affirmations. Now, my grandfather was famous for these. He passed them down to my father, who used a few of them. But I, I wrote down a few that, that my grandfather used or that maybe perhaps I may have heard in a, a movie somewhere. But a rhetorical affirmation means the person asking the question is really just trying to say yes, but they're trying to say yes in a creative way. Or they're trying to say yes in a way that puts an exclamation point on that yes. For instance, someone you ask someone a question and they retort with, is the Pope Catholic? Is the Pope Catholic? Okay, we're going to try something here. So, whoa, that almost got a good response. So we aren't supposed to like yell and woo and sing and stuff, right? So... I'm going to ask these questions, and I, I, I want to know that you guys are out there today. I see you, but I'm just not quite convinced yet, okay? I'm going to ask these rhetorical questions. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. The answer to every one of these is, uh-huh. All right, so let's practice. Uh-huh, all right, good. So is the Pope Catholic? Uh-huh, yes, he is. Is water wet? Uh-huh. Is the sky blue? Ah, uh, well. That worked out well. I was waiting. I moved that down the list just a little bit. Are summers muggy in Kansas? Uh-huh. So this next one, my, I, I got to admit, my grandfather used it. I'm a little hesitant, but I feel like I've got a little bit more space because we're outside. Is a frog's rear end watertight? I know many of you had to think about that for just a second. So let's answer it now. Or it better be, right? Is the atomic weight of cobalt 58.9? Say yes. Ghostbusters 2. Thank you, Steve. Would the tin man set off the metal detector? Yeah. This is my favorite one of all time. You ready for this one? Does a one-legged duck swim in a circle? Does a one-legged duck swim in a circle? Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, he or she does. For the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, this is, a, this is a big day. And as I was preparing, I was going one direction that I had planned to go. And I felt like God was saying, you know, that's really good. But man, this is, this is I, I want you to do something different today. And, and I really felt like I wanted to be cute. Like I wanted to be Hey, we're outside. Everybody's going to be excited. It's the first time back in a while. And I, I wanted to be really cute. And I felt like God just said, don't be cute. Let my words speak. And let my words speak for itself. The Apostle Paul, in Romans chapters 5 
through 8, which I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read some highlights. Beginning in Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to take us through chapter 8. And we're going to come to some rhetorical questions that the Apostle Paul makes after these three or four chapters. And the Apostle Paul makes these points, these rhetorical questions, these rhetorical affirmations, because he, he gives this big, long, to the point, it's a sermon is really what it is. And then he says, now let's nail home this point with some questions of which, because of all this content in 5 through 8, you should already know the answer to. So the word of the Lord, Romans 5 through 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through disobedience of the one, the one man, the many were made sinners... So also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. What shall we say then, Paul says at the beginning of chapter 6. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in that sin any longer? For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my brothers and sisters, Paul says at the beginning of chapter 7 in verse 4, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. We know that the law is spiritual, says Paul, but I am unspiritual Sold as a slave to sin, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And Paul says, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that's at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ 
our Lord. And then he says at the beginning of chapter 8, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. See, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So that all leads up to this point where Paul, and many argue that this is Paul's greatest writing right here, where he summarizes this entire section that I just summarized. In Romans 8, 31 through 39. And as we do when we're inside, would you stand with me as we hear the word of the Lord? Romans 8, 31 through 39. Think about what I just read. Because Paul starts out, he says, what then shall we shall we say in response to these things? These things being everything that happened in chapters 5 up until now. What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So Paul asks four rhetorical questions. He asks four questions that we should already know the answer to. And the Roman Christians that he was writing to should have already known these answers because they just heard the answers to these questions in chapters 5 through 8. I'm going to give you a little hint once again. The answer to each one of these questions is no one. That's the answer. The answer is no one. Can we practice that? If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Who will bring any charge against us? No one. 
Who then is the one who condemns us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Good job. Good work. Good work. If God is for us, who can be against us? In order to meet our deepest need, and our deepest need being freedom from the bondage and the consequences of sin, in order to meet that deepest need, God spared no expense. He spared no expense. Have you ever said that about someone else? Yeah, they, they spare no expense. In other words, they will go the extra mile to get something they want or, or they will give up something extra in, able, in, in order to acquire something that they need or that's better for someone else. Well, God spared no expense, not even his own son. So if God is for us, who can be against us? No one can be against us because even for us, God gave up his one and only son. So doesn't it make sense then that that would set the tone that he would be in our corner? That no matter what we come in contact with, no matter what stands against us, the fact that he already gave up his own son in order to meet our deepest need. In other words, we will never come in contact with a need that is greater than our need for salvation. And he already met that. If he is for us, who can be against us? No one. Then he says, who will bring any charge against us? No one. It's God who justifies, he says. In other words, God has already made this right. Yes, there will be people who bring charges against you, he tells the Roman Christians. There will be people who tell you you're doing it the wrong way. There will be people who say, no, you're not thinking correctly about this. There will be those people. But our way of looking at that isn't to go, oh, okay, I need to rethink this. I need to please the people around me. God says, no. No one will bring a charge against us because God has already determined our position in him. The ultimate judge has already justified us. So who will bring any charge against us? No one. Then he says, who then is the one who condemns us? I want you to think for just a moment. I want you to try to get inside the head of a woman caught in adultery. See, in John chapter 8, a woman is brought to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery, and, and the law said that because she had been caught in that act that the law said she was to be stoned. So here these people gathered around her, bring her to Jesus, probably have stones in their hand ready to, to serve justice right then and there. And here's Jesus. And can you imagine this woman? Okay, think for just a moment. You, are, you know that you're on death row. You know that your death is imminent. This woman had seen this before. I can imagine this woman down on her knees, covering her head like this, doesn't want to look up, doesn't want to see what's about to happen, and is expecting at any moment she's going to experience that first blow that's probably going to maim her. Her death is coming. And then the people ask, what should we do with her, master? And Jesus says, the one of you who's not sinned, I'm going to have you go ahead and throw the first stone at her. And one by one, they drop their stones and they walk away. 
And this whole time I can imagine this woman still down on her knees, still covering her head, covering her ears. I don't know if she heard this or not. And then Jesus says this. Jesus says, look up. Look around. Who is it that condemns you? And she says, no one. There's, there's no one here to condemn me. And can you imagine the life that must have circulated through her body at that time to be on the brink, of, to know that your end is today, right now in a few moments, and then to be released from that, to look around and to say, no one condemns me. And Paul says the same is true for us who are in Christ Jesus, who have, who have experienced that reconciliation, that justification, who have experienced that gift of salvation. And Paul says, see, Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Just like Jesus interceded for that woman, he intercedes for us. He says, wait, 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 no one condemns you because, because the, the price has already been paid. And he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is, no one. No one. No thing. See, and then Paul goes on and he lists the, this list of, of contenders. And this list of contenders, I, I, I kind of call it. So one of the things I, I missed most about this time, this quarantine time, uh, and, and I keep saying about the quarantine time that it was, and then I keep going, I don't know, maybe it's coming again. I don't know. Let's just go with it. One of the things I missed most was March Madness. I love a good bracket. Right, a good bracket, a good playoff bracket, a good tournament bracket. I love looking at them and, and studying them and, and pouring over them. And here's what I do. I go to the bracket and I look and I see, where are the Jayhawks? I don't think to look for the Wildcats. But I look for the Jayhawks. Yeah, some of you thought that was funny. Um, I look for the Jayhawks and here's what I start doing. I start going, okay, who could knock them out? Who are the contenders? Who is it that the, the KU needs to get past in order to be successful? And I go down the whole bracket, and, and I've kind of learned as a KU fan that, that all 15 of the other ones are pretty much contenders, right? They all stand in the way of KU getting to where I would like for, for the Jayhawks to get. So Paul, almost I can see like this bracket lining up. And so here's Paul. And, and somewhere there, the number one seed is the love of God. And in that bracket are all these things, the contenders. There's trouble. There's hardship. There's persecution. There's famine. There's nakedness. There's danger. There's a sword. There's death. There's, there's, there's angels, there's demons, there's present, there's a future. And, there's, and then there's the, the number two seed, I'll call it, is anything else in all creation. It's like the field. The field's the number two seed. And Paul holds up this bracket and he goes, look, the number one seed is the love of God. And here's all the contenders. And which of these can separate us? from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? And the answer is none of them. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor present, the future, any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Paul goes, okay, I'm tired of making this list now. Let's just get to the point. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, this is an important day. This is a big day. 
I don't, I don't want to make light of this day, but today in many ways feels like the start of something new. It, it feels like something, something new is, is starting here. Now, I, I say that, I say that because obviously this, this is new. This is different. And, and I've been saying this all along, and I don't say this to scare anybody, but if, if we think that here in a few weeks we're just going to get back to exactly the, th- the way things were on, on March, uh, March 8th when we met for the last time, you're kidding yourself. Okay? You're kidding yourself. So let's just get past that right now. I don't say that to scare anybody. I don't want a bunch of people afterwards going, what are you talking about? What are we doing? What's this going to look like? What are you going to do? Should I come back next week? Should I come back the weekend? Things are going to be different. And I think that's okay. I think that's okay. And I know it's okay because there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. There's no pandemic. There's no, there's no six feet of space. There's no, I don't know, is the African dust cloud here? Does anyone know yet? I don't know what it's supposed to look like. There's no murder hornet. There's, there, 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 there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So whatever anything, whatever things look like from this point forward, if we can keep ourselves, our families, and our church anchored in the truth that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, we are setting a firm foundation. And that is the foundation from which everything from this point forward is built. No matter what it looks like, no matter what fears or uneasiness that might bring, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
to be together. Man, this is exciting. I know it's early in the morning, and you guys have like had kind of trouble getting as excited as we are up here, but this is exciting. Turn to your neighbor and say, it is good to see your lovely face. It's good to see your lovely face. Thank you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, and also your face. You chose the neighbor. I did not choose for you. Uh, hey, this has been really great. We've really been looking forward to this. Uh, like we've said um, in the past few weeks leading up to this, we have never stopped being the church. But this is just, a, it's good to have an opportunity to be the church all together, right? And so uh, it's, it's good to gather. Um, next Sunday, we're going to do this again. The original plan the original plan was to start meeting indoors on July 5th, but because of the changes in Douglas County's phasing in, uh, we've, we want to respect that and we want to keep our, uh, our gatherings kind of distance as we've been able to do today. And so next Sunday, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to push it back just a little bit. We're going to start at 9 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. So uh, uh, it still feels pretty nice right now, so hopefully we can still uh, have a have a nice morning together. So next Sunday, July fifth at nine a.m. Uh, yeah, at nine a.m. right here in the same spot. We'll have the same parking situation if you want to be in your vehicle or if you want to bring chairs and blankets. But we're gonna be outdoors together next Sunday, and then we'll let you know what the rest of July looks like uh, once we kind of hear from Douglas County and we. Uh, get together as a staff and as a board, a leadership team, then we'll let you know what that time together looks like. Thank you to the engagement, uh, I'm sorry, to the connection team who uh, got here early and helped us with parking and helped us set everything up. There was a lot of extra stuff. Thank you for the tech team for setting stuff up for today, uh, for uh, Pastor Alyssa and her lead team for getting engagement bags so we can keep our hands busy. And there's uh, just a lot of people making uh, putting some extra effort into a day like today to make this happen. There are a lot of moving parts behind the scenes. Um, and thank you guys for being willing to get up and get out early. If you are a kid that grabbed one of those engagement bags, you take the whole bag home with you, but the clipboard, uh, turn those back in, and we'll have those for you again next week. We'll sanitize those and have them clean for everybody, okay? So turn your clipboard back in, but the rest of the bag you get to keep. All right? Well, will you stand with me and receive this word? People of God, no one can stand against us and no one can stand between us and the love of God. That is absolutely ours, a free gift given. And we then have an opportunity to take that love and spread it to the world around us. So nothing can stand between God and you and, the, and his love for you. And don't let anything stand between you and spreading that love to the rest of the world. And before I send you in peace, I think there's one more thing. Yeah? Is your mic on? I asked him to turn it, it on. There, there we go. <clears throat> I forgot to do offering. And you're all like... I know, we knew you forgot because we've been waiting to give today. We're a little out of practice. <laughs> we're, a little, we're a little rough. Yes, a little rough. But hey, there is a box on this table as you leave. If you have it with you physically and want to drop it off, you can do that there. Um, and as always, we have our online uh, giving option uh, on Tithely. I did not uh, overlook that on purpose. I, it just slipped my mind with all this going on so thank you okay we good all right i think that's i think that if we remember anything else we'll email you all right <laughs> thanks for being here go in peace we'll see you next week